Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. As if the pandemic itself wasn't enough to deal with, the world is also watching with horror at events in the US where systematic police brutality is being endorsed and encouraged by racism at the highest political level. We stand in solidarity with those who are taking to the streets in the US and around the world to express their anger and to make it clear that black lives matter. So we're all aware of the killing of George Floyd by a police officer in America. And it seems quite rightly that the police officer is now charged with murder. Now the police officer knew George apparently, uh, he'd had previous disciplinary action for using excessive force, maybe the police didn't respond to that sufficiently. Was racism a factor? Very possibly, we can't really know. Now there have been protests in America following this, which is quite understandable, but there have also been riots that have led to the deaths of a number of people, burning buildings, uh, indiscriminate violence, looting, and this is quite a common sequence of events. It's happened several times in America, and it's also happened in the United Kingdom. Remember in 2011, a black man was shot by the police. Subsequently, after all the inquiries, they decided that it was justified, but it led to protests which very quickly uh, led to rioting and looting. But we're not here to talk about politics and events in the United States or in other parts of the world. If you want to see police brutality and mistreatment of minority groups, there are a lot of examples around the world we could talk about. But we're here to talk about what goes on in the Scottish Parliament. So we've heard Patrick Harvey ask a question. Let's hear Nicola Sturgeon answer it. First Minister. Well, can I uh, say that uh, I too feel uh, total solidarity uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement. We are all looking on with uh, concern and horror at the scenes uh, unfolding in the United States. And um, I uh, believe the President of the United States has a duty to uh, address uh, the underlying causes uh, of the protests, uh, the legitimate uh, protests we are seeing, uh, rather than continuously attacking uh, those uh, protesting. So Nicola Sturgeon supports the Black Lives Matter movement. Note, she didn't say that she believes that Black Lives Matter. She said that she supports that movement. Right, let's have a look at the website of Black Lives Matter and see what they're all about. We call for a national defunding of the police. I mean, that is just bonkers, isn't it? That is too crazy to even start considering, but that's uh, what they're calling for. What else have they got to say? We are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. We build a space that affirms black women and is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men are centered. So the usual sort of extreme progressive social justice sort of ideology. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. Excuse me, it's not Western prescribed, it's a human universal. Anyway, they disrupt the nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to a degree that mothers, parents and children are comfortable. Right, so they see themselves as attacking and replacing the idea of uh, family life to some degree. Uh, we foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual, unless he, she, or they disclose otherwise. Okay, right, so I think we can safely say these people are not on the Scottish Family Party's wavelength. And I would guess, if you're watching this video, they're probably not on yours either. But Nicholas Sturgeon is endorsing them. So you can see here, Black Lives Matter is an organisation, it's a campaigning group that's an extreme, hard-left, hyper-progressive uh, group of activists. So, Black Lives Matter, yes they do. I mean, personally, I would be reluctant to actually use that form of words because you're associating yourself with this campaigning group. I mean, it's a bit like the trick that Britain First used to do a few years ago. Remember Britain First, the sort of um, hard-right group uh, in England mainly? They would put something on Facebook that like had a picture of a school nativity. Then they'd say, if you think schools should have nativities, click like. And when you click like, then you're liking their page. 
and people didn't realize that what they were actually liking was a whole load of other things whereas they actually just agreed to one part of their agenda so we've got the same sort of thing happening here with black lives matter but nicola sturgeon signs up no question then we've got police in scotland taking the knee and aligning themselves with the black lives matter movement now in doing that the police are making the same mistake they make with their lgbt rainbow police cars if the police want to say we want to treat all races well we're determined to keep free of racism then say that that's absolutely fine but to do that don't endorse controversial political campaigns in the process that surely should be pretty straightforward but the police don't seem to get it and frankly it's because the government don't get it either so Patrick Harvey and Nicola Sturgeon expressing support for people taking to the streets. Now, if they're meaning protesters, peaceful protesters, okay, that's all well and good. But they also know there's been a huge amount of rioting, looting, wanton and indiscriminate destruction. So in the name of balance, would it not be good to condemn that? It's not the obvious thing to say as well. Now, Nicola Sturgeon did restrict her comments to legitimate protesters, but she didn't have anything negative to say about the criminality. Patrick Harvey, he didn't try to make any distinction at all. The First Minister recently received a letter from the STUC Black Workers Committee regarding COVID-19 and highlighting that black and minority ethnic groups remain overrepresented in the at-risk communities identified by the government. So can the First Minister tell us when the Scottish Government will publish its own up-to-date analysis of the impact of COVID on black and minority ethnic people and will she commit to acting on all of the issues raised in the committee's letter? Well, we better see what this letter says. First, we're calling on the First Minister of Scotland to herself acknowledge and to condemn the rise of racist rhetoric that we've seen during this pandemic. Is that really the case? Has there really been a rise in racist rhetoric? Have you noticed that? I don't really think so. All these sort of organisations, these sort of campaigners in the um, coronavirus pandemic, they're all saying the same things. The feminist organisations are saying it's particularly impacting women. The LGBT groups are saying this is particularly difficult for LGBT people. And these people focused on race are saying it's been particularly difficult for people of a certain race. It's been worse for them in particular during lockdown. Next one. Black and minority ethnic workers are employed at a higher rate within the key workers category identified by government and yet are more likely to be paid less than their white counterparts. They're overrepresented in roles and jobs which put them at even greater risk of being exposed to illness and disease. Okay, there's more black minority ethnic people employed as key workers. So what? That's just a matter of luck that they happen to be the ones who've been most exposed. For example, I think there's more women than men working for the NHS. So more women will be exposed to danger of infection through working with the NHS. Is that sort of in, some sort of injustice? Just the way things have worked out. And if there's a war, it will be men predominantly in the army who will be at risk for having to fight the war. That's some terrible injustice? No. So the Scottish Government has urged to, one, record, analyse and publish the disaggregated data on how COVID-19 has affected black and minority ethnic communities. That's one way it could actually be useful to have information about different races, how they're affected by COVID-19. And that's because there might be significant genetic factors that might help in finding treatments. But that's not what they're talking about here. They're suggesting that there must be some sort of injustice, some sort of discrimination against various races. So these sort of people, they're forever wanting to divide society into different groups, get statistics about them, and wherever they're different, there's some injustice there. If you divide society into any group, if you draw a line across the nation in any direction, the statistics for one group and another group are likely to be different in some ways. It doesn't mean there's something unfair. It's just the way things are. So in the United Kingdom as a whole, there have been significant differences in the number of people seriously affected by coronavirus. There could be various reasons for that. Maybe people in different racial groups might tend to be in different sort of jobs, different sorts of housing, different family size, different degree of adherence to the lockdown rules. There might be genetic differences. There might be differences in existing health conditions, and there might be differences in lifestyle. But none of those amount to any sort of injustice. Well, let's hear Nicola Sturgeon's answer. Um, on the issue of uh, analysis of the impact of COVID, um, as uh, Patrick Harvey is uh, possibly uh, aware, Public Health Scotland uh, released some initial analysis, I think two weeks ago today on the, uh, the 
20th uh, of May, if I'm getting my, my dates uh, correct, where it said it had undertaken uh, initial analysis to investigate whether COVID-19 outcomes uh, varied by ethnic group. Uh, they said in uh, that report that further work uh, was required. Um, and based on the available data to date, the proportion of ethnic minority patients among those seriously ill uh, appeared to be no higher than uh, the proportion in the Scottish population generally. But they caveated that by saying further work uh, was required and further work uh, will be done. And in parallel, uh, work has been undertaken to explore and understand the patterns uh, emerging from other parts of the UK. So this is uh, what we take very very seriously and I know Public Health Scotland will be as keen to understand it and report its understanding uh, as quickly as possible. So there are. the answer is basically that there's no difference in Scotland. They haven't found any difference between racial groups. Now Nicola Sturgeon is almost apologetic as she says that. She has to take so long to say it. She said okay we haven't found anything but we'll keep trying to find it. We're taking, very, we're taking it very seriously. We'll see what we can find in the future. Now, we've got to bear in mind that the Scottish Government has a finite amount of brain power. And what do you want them to be using it on? Do you want them to be going through the data with a fine tooth comb, trying to find racial grievances in it? Or do you want to be getting on with trying to tackle the virus? Number two, ensure black and minority ethnic workers are paid well and fairly and that they have all the protective equipment and rights at work to keep them safe. The point here is really obvious, isn't it? I mean, what they're saying there applies to everyone, but it's inviting people to see it in race terms. So I need personal protective equipment, and, and that's because I'm black, or I should have a pay rise, and that's something to do with me being black, because black people need to be paid more. Now, the Conservative government, with Theresa May, they introduced a consultation about having companies having to report their race pay gap. I'm not sure where that's got to. The consultation's completed. I'm not sure if the Conservative government is going to take that forward or not. But it's a bad idea. I mean, the NHS, the highest earnings are for Asians. I don't know if you know, apparently in Britain, one in 20 Indian, Indian background men is a doctor compared to one in 200 of the general population. Right, is that a problem? Does this pay gap in the NHS that puts Asians earning more than other races. Is that a problem that needs solving? No. Should I be saying this is unfair on white people? We demand our rights. We want a quota for white doctors. No, I really don't care. Just pick whoever are the best doctors and that's fine by me. But generally in Britain, it's the same in America actually. If you take the average salary for white people, then the average salary for Asians can be a little bit higher. Average salary for Afro-Caribbeans can be a little bit lower. If you look into a bit more detail, generally the highest earners in Britain or America are Jews. Now, if you see things as a power struggle and you know, there's, there's an injustice, so if one race is earning a bit more than the other on average, that must be unfair. Somehow it's ill-gotten gains. The government needs to somehow take it away from them and redistribute it to the group that's been treated unfairly. Where does that sort of thinking lead you? Well, what about the Jews in that case? They must be the worst of the lot. They must be really cheating the system somehow. That's a really grave injustice. What are they up to? And then you see how you get anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, for example, because they go right down this uh, group battle, power struggle mentality. But that's how divisive identity politics is. So why are the difference in the earnings between different races? There are all sorts of reasons. I'm going to discuss one of them later, and that is family breakdown. And now family breakdown, it seems to be exactly what the Black Lives Matter organization is endorsing. Later on, I'm going to show you a video clip of Barack Obama taking the opposite view. But in order to have justice in society, that needs to be justice for individuals. As soon as you try and have justice on a group level, that results in injustice on an individual level. So if companies have to start publishing their race pay gap, they might find Oh, you know, that, that black people in our organisation, that their average pays a bit lower. What can we do about it? We'd better promote some black people. And then other people working in that organisation will think, ah, I can see what's going on here. This is pretty obvious. And what will they feel? They'll resent it. Does that help eliminate racism? It does the opposite. It stirs up racial tensions. And I heard of a high school uh, in Scotland where a deputy head's job came up. And one of the applicants was someone in the school who was a disabled gay man. And there were some other people in the school who would have liked to apply, 
when they saw that he was applying, they thought, what's the point? There's no point even bothering. He's obviously going to get it. Same with the gender pay gap. Companies think, oh, gender pay gap is still a bit big. What can we do about it? We better promote some women, hadn't we? And people, the men start catching on thinking, hang on a minute, I can see what's happening here. I've been working really hard, aiming for that job, and I didn't really have a fair chance. And it just produces division and resentment. So race pay gaps, just forget it. Focus on equality of opportunity and keep the race issue completely off the agenda. Okay, so the Scottish Government is following this faulty ideology. But surely there's hope. Surely the opposition party, the Conservatives, can offer a different perspective. Surely there'll be a strong challenge to this. I'm obviously joking, aren't I? Uh, this is uh, Annie Wells, Conservative Deputy Leader. Uh, a Scottish Government official who took the knee in support of the Black Lives Matter campaign. And Annie Wells said this, that gesture would be far more meaningful if her own government's record in recruiting and promoting ethnic minorities wasn't so shameful. So she's saying the government needs to be promoting people on the basis of race, not on merit, on the basis of race. And that's the Scottish Conservatives for you. It's essential that we highlight the pressing long-standing need which exists for the health inequalities which are faced by black and minority ethnic communities to be addressed. These inequalities are exacerbated by institutionalised discriminatory practices embedded within the UK and Scottish health systems and which impact on the way in which black and minority ethnic communities access and receive treatment. Well, that sounds a fair point to me. I mean, just think of the doctors and nurses that you know. I mean, they're all really racist, aren't they? I mean, you can probably just imagine them thinking, oh, I'm not going to bother giving that person their, their medicine because they're black. I mean, it's just total nonsense, isn't it? Total nonsense. But if you plant that idea in people's minds, the health service is biased against you then people will start finding evidence for it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I hurt my back uh, playing golf. So I went to the A&E, went to triage. I was in agony. It was really painful. And they left me there for hours. Half of Edinburgh went through before I got to see a doctor who told me that I just should do nothing. It would get, back, get better on its own. In fact, by the time I saw him, it had almost got better. Right, but I, if I'd have been told they've got a really bad bias against people with English accents. They always put them to the back of the list. I just sat there, sat there thinking, is that true? I wonder if that's why it's taken so long. It was actually, they've been perfectly fair. It just there was actually wasn't much wrong with me. But if you plant this thought in people's minds, people will find evidence for the theories. So we're going to try and close these inequalities. That will result in misdirecting resources. Because the implication is, it's more important to be saving the lives or improving the health of a black and minority ethnic person than it is for, say, a white person, because we've got to close the inequalities. And that's the route to misdirecting resources. Resources should be directed to where they're going to bring the most benefit to the most people. Simple as that. Um, on the issue of the letter from uh, the SUC Black Workers Committee, I have received that letter. I've actually just this morning signed a response to the letter, which will go to them uh, this afternoon, which uh, I hope they will see as a comprehensive response uh, to the very uh, reasonable and legitimate points that they were raising. Now, I want to nail this down here, because it's quite a charge I'm making against Nicola Sturgeon. Right, the letter talks about institutionalised discriminatory practices in NHS Scotland, discriminatory on grounds of race. So that's saying the NHS is racist. So that's what the letter says. And the concern raised in the letter is that the NHS's inherent racism is affecting the health outcomes for black and minority ethnic people. Now, Nicola Sturgeon says that that is a reasonable and legitimate concern. Okay. If that's a reasonable concern, a legitimate concern, that the racism of the NHS is having these consequences, then she's endorsing the view that the NHS is racist. So why is she going out and clapping this organisation? I mean, shouldn't Nicola Sturgeon be challenging the NHS on primetime television, telling them they're racists? I mean, it's a bit of a juggling act Nicola Sturgeon is engaged in here. She's trying to say different things to different audiences. She's got this letter from the Black Trade Union group and she wants to keep them happy by basically saying what they want to hear. But on the other hand, she would never want to criticise the NHS or cast aspersions about its moral authority. So she's trying to get away with saying different things to different audiences and hoping that they don't realise what's going on. 
but you can't get away with that while the Scottish family party is around. So calling the NHS racist is utterly, totally outrageous, and I would hope lots of people involved in the NHS will find that gravely offensive. Uh, we all have to look ourselves in the mirror and we all have to consider what we are going to do uh, to combat uh, racism and I certainly rededicate myself uh, to that as First Minister. Okay, so what should be done to combat racism? I mean, the first thing is the society needs to try to produce good people. That's sort in education, sort in families, but it's broader as well. So whether you think racism in Scotland is a really serious problem or it's not such a serious problem, that's a really important thing in order to move forward. If people are virtuous, respectful, etc., they're not going to be racist. So the target should be virtue, not political correctness. So we don't need things like this. Well, another way I think to tackle racism is don't politicise it. But if you politicise race, then that creates the impression that it's a power struggle between groups. Now, people like Patrick Harvey, and it's, it's the view that dominates in the Scottish Parliament, is that that's the way you should view society, as a, a competition between different groups. So one group is trying to wrest power and control from the other group. Now, inevitably, if you take that attitude between races, it's going to create tension. So I'm sure almost everyone in Scotland is very welcoming of you know new Scots, people who've come from other parts of the world. Welcome, hope you enjoy it. Uh, come and join in what we've got in this nation. But if they start to hear those people saying, this is really unjust, we, we want to seize power and wealth and control from you, how is that going to go down? It's inevitably going to lead to resistance and tension. A lot of the time, issues are seen as issues of race when they're actually issues of culture. I mean, people of different cultures can sometimes find it a bit more difficult to relate to each other. It's more comfortable, it's easier to relate to someone of a more similar culture. But if you've got an organisation, say you're running a business, where there's different groups like that, and you know they're a little bit separate from each other, you want to bring them together, what's the best way to do it? Would you have race awareness workshops? Or would it be best to have a big team building activity that everyone joined in with and got to know each other? In other words, are you going to try and divide people by focusing on the differences or are you going to unite them by engaging in a common activity? I think uniting by engaging in common activity is the way forward. Societies that have race problems. I mean, the US has got a race problem to an extent, to a degree that we haven't got in Scotland or in Britain uh, in general. South Africa as well. I've been to South Africa. You're aware of it there. In America and in South Africa, I've heard people talking, but they're not racist particularly, but they'll talk about the blacks as if that's a distinct group that is, they may as well be a different country. It's just a section of society that's very much separate and different from their own. I don't think we really have that in Scotland. There's much better integration. But if you encourage people to see their group identity, their race, etc., as their primary identity, then you're going to head towards this parallel society idea, and that's when the tensions can emerge. Now, black people in the United States, there are, there are a lot of problems associated with black society in America. And a large part of that, people uh, think, stems from family breakdown, and in particular, fatherlessness. So just have a listen to this. This is Barack Obama talking a bit of sense. But of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, we are most dependent on the family. The family is that most important foundation. And we are called to recognize and honor how critical every father is to that foundation. They are teachers and coaches, they're mentors and they're role models. They are examples of success and the men who constantly push us towards success. But if we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that too many fathers are also missing. Missing from too many lives and too many homes. They've abandoned their responsibilities. They're acting like boys instead of men. And the foundations of our family have suffered because of it. You and I know this is true everywhere, but nowhere is it more true than in the African-American community. We know that more than half 
of all black children live in single parent households. Half, a number that's doubled since we were children. We know the statistics that children who grow up with a fa out of father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime. They're nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They're more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teen parents because the father wasn't in the home. The foundations of our community and our country are weaker because of this. We can't simply write these problems off to past injustices. Those injustices are real. There's a reason why our families are dis in disrepair, and some of it has to do with a tragic history. But we can't keep on using that as an excuse. But the change we need is not just going to come from government. It's not just going to come from a president. It's going to come from us. It's going to come from each and every one of us. We need families to raise our children. We need fathers to recognize that responsibility doesn't just end at conception. That doesn't just make you a father. What makes you a man is not the ability to have a child. Any fool can have a child. That doesn't make you a father. It's the courage to raise a child that makes you a father. And, and listen uh, to, to all the mothers out there. You need help. You need help. We need to help all those mothers out there who are raising their kids by themselves. The mothers who drop them off at school and go to work and pick them up in the afternoon and work another shift and get dinner and make lunches and pay the bills and fix the house and protect the family and do all the things that a parent is supposed to do. So many women in our community are doing this in a heroic fashion. We're so proud of all those single moms who are out there doing just incredible work but they need support. They shouldn't have to be doing it all by themselves. Well, that's spot on, isn't it? That could be a Scottish family party script. He's reading that. To be honest, I don't think Barack Obama would say that now. Saying families need fathers, that's a bit controversial these days. If he were a teacher in Scotland saying that, the General Teaching Council of Scotland might well be threatening to strike him off for saying that families need fathers. But anyway, in 2008, he was talking sense. So tackling racism, how can we do that? Through character education, in schools in particular, through our personal example, through our conversations, through dealing with racist crime. You don't need to call it hate crime, just deal with the actual crime. But tackling racism isn't the same thing as entering into racial identity politics. Racial identity politics divides society and leads to tension. In fact, it leads to racism. This is a really important point. What do you want as the foundation of Scottish society? Intergroup competition or unity? We choose unity. And if you want that promoting clearly in the Scottish Parliament, you need to support the Scottish Family Party. And the best way to do that is by joining us right now. There's a link below. Thanks for watching.